Click on page eight again of the service folder. In the bold print is the heart work for this week. It's also the text uh, for this sermon. And I'd like to share, uh, read that out together so we can share it with each other once again. Matthew 13, verse 8 together. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Jesus tells the parable of the sower, and in it, the seed that he talks about is the word of God, the Holy Scripture. Now, for generations, up until about my generation or so, it went without saying that this was the authoritative and reliable Word of God. It certainly is that. But for too long, it has gone without saying. And now we have a generation living today that doesn't believe that about the Bible. They think the Bible, at best, is just like any other book. And in the Gospel of Jesus Bible study that we do here at St. Matthew on occasion, we start that Bible study not by looking at Jesus, but by looking at the Bible and why we can trust the Bible. Historians and academics, especially those on the university level, seem to have no trouble at all accepting the veracity and authenticity of, say, Julius Caesar's Gaelic Wars, or Gallic Wars, that he wrote sometime between 144 B.C. Same with Plato's philosophical writings that were written sometime between 427 and 327 B.C. And Homer's Iliad, believed to have been written around 900 B.C. The earliest ten Manuscripts, keep that number in mind, of Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars date to about 900 AD. The ten earliest manuscripts of Julius Caesar's work date to 900 AD, or about a thousand years, or about, about a thousand years after he wrote it. The earliest seven manuscripts of Plato's writings also date to about 900 A.D. Seven of them we have. The earliest of them are from seven, eight, seven of them from 900 A.D. That puts it at 1,200 years after he wrote it. And the earliest manuscripts of Homer's Iliad. Now, there are over 600 of these, but they date to about 400 B.C., which puts it 400 or 500 years after he wrote it. And again, historians and academics have no trouble at all accepting the authenticity of these writings, even though the manuscript evidence is relatively little or few, and is so many centuries after they were originally supposedly written. But today, many historians and academics and a large majority of non-Christian millennials, millennials are those who were born after 1980, they believe that the Bible is, at best, equal to these other writings, but far more common, is that they consider that the Bible is an outdated book with no relevance for today, or a story, mythology, symbolic, fairy tale. And the worst I saw, they believe that it is a dangerous book of religious dogma used for centuries to oppress people. The writings of Caesar, Plato, and Homer, using the same manuscript evidence, there's relatively little evidence at all in those 500 to 1,000 years after the writings. But let's compare the evidence we have in the New Testament writings. The New Testament was written over a span of about 60 years, from about 40 A.D. to about 100 A.D. And our earliest copies are fragments of the New Testament. They date to 125 A.D., although there is some evidence that there may be a manuscript that dates even earlier into the first century A.D., but they're still debating that. But these earliest fragments that we know for a fact are from 125 A.D., put it only 25 to 85 years after the New Testament was written. But here's the most interesting fact of that. Where you had only 10 copies of Julius Caesar's book, and so many thousand, a thousand years after it, and only seven copies of Plato's writings and only a little over 600 copies of 
Homer's Iliad, there are 24,000 copies of or the fragments of the New Testament that date to 125 AD. The overwhelming evidence of the authenticity of the New Testament scriptures has for too many generations gone without saying, but no more. I won't let it happen anymore. We need to change that. We need to speak of it and we need to tell people that we can continue to trust the evidence as well as the truthfulness of the scriptures themselves by what happens when people read the Bible and do what the Bible says and using it as this love letter from God and how to live a godly life. Jesus reminds us of the power of God's word in today's parable from Matthew 13. The word of God is a seed and it is a seed by which the Holy Spirit grows faith in a person. Saving faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And the seed that the, that the Word of God is, of course, the Bible. But it is also baptism, where God's Word is joined to water, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, is joined to that water, and that creates faith, and forgives the sins of the person who is baptized. And... The seed that is used in this parable can also be seen as the Lord's Supper, the sacrament of the altar, where the Word of God is joined to the bread and the wine, and it becomes the body and blood of Jesus, given to us Christians to eat and drink for the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. We call these things the means of grace. That They are the things through which God's grace comes to you and me. And they give us forgiveness of sins, life, and eternal salvation because Jesus bled and died on the cross to save us from our sins. Now Jesus is warning us in the parable what happens to the word of God. What can happen if we're not on our guard? We need to be on our guard against the evil one who comes and snatches away what is sown in our heart because we do not continue to seek understanding of the Bible through regular Bible study and worship. And I have in mind here our confirmation classes. They're so eager to learn God's Word. They memorize it. They put it in their hearts. They come to class. They do the homework. And they study their Word. But after they're confirmed, look at how so many of them never come back again. And Jesus warns them, if you don't continue in that, the devil will snatch it away. And you will be lost. Then there's the, we need to be on guard against the tribulation or persecution that comes to tear out the shallow rooted seed. Here I have in mind that we grow up as Christians in the church, but then we get into the world and we start to hear things from the world. You Christians are so closed minded and you are even hate groups because you hate people who self-identify as a different gender or no gender at all or who would like to have homosexual marriage, just for two examples. And so we get scared. And that shallow rooted word gets torn out. And we say, well, yeah, you're right. The church is evil. And I need to be away from that. No. Because the truth really is, who would be interested in telling that to people is not God, but Satan. The truth is that the church loves all people, just as Jesus loves all people. And we want to reach out with love to everyone. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what they think of themselves. God loves them so much that he sent Jesus to die for them. And he gives you and me the task of telling them the love of Jesus and the love of God in Jesus Christ. And so we love them. God, and tell them God loves you so much and wants a wonderful plan for your life, a wonderful, wonderful way of living. And then there's, we have to be on our guard against the cares of the world and deceitfulness of riches. It is very, Jesus would say, it's very difficult for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God because they get so caught up in getting riches and then keeping riches. And that can choke out the word in our lives. So what's the best way to be on guard against all of this stuff? Well, you're doing one of them right now. You have banded together in the safety of numbers with brothers and sisters in Christ. You have gathered together for this gospel-type worship. The life of Jesus. In fact, that's what we're going to talk about in the adult discipleship class tonight. That this entire worship service reflects the entire life of Jesus. His birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. 
It's all right here, and I'm going to walk the class through that tonight. And how every place that I stood, and all the places, all the things that we sang, or heard read, or read ourselves, tell the story of Jesus. That strengthens our faith as well. But you also should be reading your Bibles every day. Read your Bible. Open it up. Now, some of you may try. All right, I'll start in Genesis. In fact, I just continued, concluded Genesis, and I've been reading one chapter a day. So it took me. As I read it Monday through Friday, it took me 10 weeks, because there's 50 chapters. I read a, a chapter a day five times a week, so it took me 10 weeks. But then you might, if you're going to go that route, you might get bogged down in, say, Numbers or Leviticus. August is coming up in just a couple weeks. 31 days in August. 31 chapters in Proverbs. Read a chapter a day in the, book, in the month of August, and you'll have read an entire book of the Bible that is packed with wonderful stuff. Not only the love of God, but how God wants his people to live. And you can also check in some shorter books of the Bible, like Ruth, four chapters, Obadiah, not even a chapter, First, Third John, not even chapters, just verses. Short books that you can get through and hear about the love of God and read and doing the things that you can to strengthen your faith in that good soil. Jesus promises that the Holy Spirit will make our hearts good soil. As we read, the Holy Spirit will open our hearts to understand it. We don't have to come up with this on our own. God will explain it to us through the Holy Spirit, and we'll begin to understand as we go through life especially. It's one of those things with the book of Psalms. You can read the Psalms as a, a young person, and then come back 50 years later and read it again. Same Psalms. The words didn't change, but your life has changed over the span of 50 years, and it becomes new and fresh every time you go back to it. Now remember, too, that you will bear fruit as the Word of God is planted in you and starts to be cultivated and grow in you. It will bear the fruit of love and service, love of God and service to one another, but not identical yields. That's the thing that Jesus teaches us. Not every apple has a dozen seeds in it. Last night, or Thursday night's apple only had seven seeds. This one had 12, but in each seed, that one seed are thousands of apples. And you may have a crop of 100 or 60 or 30, as Jesus says. He's telling us that you'll have different outcomes to sharing the gospel. You don't all have to be the same and don't expect to have the same outcomes. But you will have yields nonetheless. That's the promise of Jesus. Let's pray. O holy and most merciful God, you have taught us the way of your commandments. We implore you to pour out your grace into our hearts, cause it to bear fruit in us, that being ever mindful of your mercies and your laws, we may always be directed to your will and daily increase in love toward you and one another. Enable us to resist all evil and to live a godly life. Help us to follow the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to walk in his steps until we shall possess the kingdom that has been prepared for us in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord.